Now let's turn to the US where Joe Biden just threw a massive party for an old friend, Japan. Their Prime Minister Fumio Kishida is on a state visit. It's the first in almost nine years. I'm sure you know how state visits work. It's not just bilateral talk. It's a lot more. You have a ceremonial welcome at the White House, sometimes a private lunch, and of course the main event, a gala dinner. Both Biden and Kishida toasted the bilateral relationship, but Kishida had a secret weapon up his sleeve, a quote from American cult classic, Star Trek. We may be divided by distance, but the generations after generation, we've been brought together the same hopes, the same values, the same commitment to democracy and freedom and the digni dignity for all. And today, without question, our alliance is literally stronger than it has ever been. And finally, let me conclude with a line from Star Trek, <laughs> uh, which you all know. <laughs> to boldly go where no one has gone before. <laughs> and boldly go. Cheers. That was the fun part. Now we get to the business. Biden and Kishida have upgraded their defense partnership. They signed some 70 agreements, 70, 70 deals, but three of them stood out. One, to create a joint command structure where American and Japanese officers work together. Two, a missile pact. Japan, Australia, and the US will develop an air missile network, sort of like a common shield. And three, a new trilateral exercise between the US, the UK, and Japan. All these deals have the same goal, to create more interoperability between the militaries. Say an attack happens on Taiwan, the US and Japan should be able to respond fast and together. That's the goal here. And Kishida was very clear about it. He linked the situation in Ukraine to East Asia. A bit like saying, Taiwan could be the next Ukraine. Regarding Russia's aggression of Ukraine, Based on a recognition that Ukraine today may be East Asia tomorrow, taking the issue as our own problem for Japan, I expressed our resolution to continue with stringent sanctions against Russia and strong support for Ukraine. Biden's focus is also clear. He's hosted five leaders for state visits. Emmanuel Macron of France, Yoon Suk Kyol of South Korea, Narendra Modi of India, Anthony Albanese of Australia, and now Fumio Kishida of Japan. What is common about these five nations? They're all Indo-Pacific powers, even France, with islands in the Indian and Pacific Oceans. But tonight we're focusing on Japan. Are they ready for this military upgrade? Can Fumio Kishida lead it? And how has the U.S. defended Japan in the past? Let's start with Kishida. He's been hit by a fundraising scandal. He's among the least popular Japanese leaders since 1947. And what's his approval rating? Just 26%. His cabinet is even worse. Only 20% Japanese approve of their performance. So Kishida is on shaky ground. But he's been clear about one thing. Japan must increase its military might. After the Second World War, Tokyo chose pacificism. They don't have a standing army. They have a self-defense force. But recently, we've seen a shift. It started with former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. He increased defense spending by 10%, and now Kishida is building on it. Last year, he unveiled a new defense budget. Guess how much money has been set aside? $56 billion, which is a 16% increase in defense spending. Again, it's because of public opinion. Let me show you what a recent poll found. 83% Japanese fear an attack. From whom? Well, 89% people think that China is a concern, 87% say the attack may come from North Korea. So what do they want their government to do? Many of them would like to deepen the alliance with the US. 49% want Japan to expand its role within the alliance. The number was only 41% in 2020. So the last few years have changed public opinion. Most Japanese want a strong military. And the government is obliging. This week, Tokyo unveiled an aircraft carrier. It's their first one since the Second World War. What's more, it can service American F-35 fighter jets. So Japan is worried and arming itself. Which brings us to the United States. What role does Washington play in defending Japan? There are three parts to it. The first is a treaty. The Treaty of Mutual Cooperation and Security, it was it was first signed in 1951, then tweaked and renewed in 1960. 
And what does the treaty say? Let me quote. Each party recognizes that an armed attack against either party in the territories under the administration of Japan would be dangerous to its own peace and safety and declares that it would act to meet the common danger. It's not clear, it's not as clear as NATO's mutual defense clause, but the assumption is that the U.S. will defend Japan. That is the treaty. They will defend Japan even with nuclear weapons because Tokyo is part of the U.S. nuclear umbrella. Which brings us to the second part of their relationship, soldiers and bases. The U.S. has more than 55,000 soldiers in Japan, not advisors, not civilian contractors, active duty troops, 55,000. And how many bases? In 2021, the United States had access to 120 bases in Japan, more than anywhere else in the world, 120 bases. And finally, the third part, weapons. Japan uses a lot of American equipment, like Patriot missiles, the F-35 fighter jets, the Cobra helicopters, and the Apache helicopters. This year, a new deal was signed. Japan decided to buy hundreds of Tomahawk missiles. Total cost, more than $2.3 billion. It's really a give and take relationship. The US presence and weapons give Japan insurance both against China and North Korea. In return, the U.S. gets a staging point in East Asia, a place to rush in from if China invades Taiwan. 